Unlike most Western newsmen, Davis preferred to go with the Asian soldiers. That's where the fighting was heaviest. And he discovered something about himself. The quick reflexes that he developed as a professional football player were protecting him on the battlefield. He became aware of a sense that often allowed him to react to danger before it actually happened. And Davis was continually testing it. I would always try and go to the extreme front line because that's where the best film is. You can't get the spontaneity of action if you're not there. You can't get it if you're 100 metres behind the soldiers trying to get it with a telephoto lens. You don't see the faces, the expressions on their faces. You don't see the compassion that they may show for their wounded comrades or their enemy for that matter. I wanted to show all those things and the only way to show them was being in the front line, the real front line. idea is for a news cameraman get the film and keep it rolling no matter what happens covering a um a grenade thrower, the man I knew as a grenade thrower, he was an ace grenade thrower, and he was a little section of only five men, they were South Vietnamese. And I'd known him before, and uh, so I went with them. It was a big action overall, but it was a big action is like a small action. You're only concerned about what happens to you. And we're in a village in an overgrown graveyard, a Catholic village, and the VC were in that graveyard. And he took almost everything off. He just had tight shoes and tight pants on, took his boots, everything off. And he had a little plastic shopping bag in which he carried his grenades. And his friends covered him with very accurate fire as he crawled out to the closest tombstone, which gave him some cover, and, and he would just pick them off one after the other quickly and spray them where he knew the VC were. He did that three times and he came back sort of laughing and said, got them, that got them, they're gone. As it happened, they were, except for one or two. And he s sat up and on his knees and started to put his clothes back on, his protective clothes, his flak jacket, his steel jacket, uh, well, steel lion jacket. And uh, at that stage, I was filming him. I kept filming him. And there was a spray of gunfire, uh, which went above my head and I could see behind him where it cut the leaves and into the tree. And he fell forward saying, the Vietnamese word, chet, which is, means dead. We meant I'm dead, I suppose. But he, I thought, I kept on filming on him, and he, I thought he, I can't be hit. I didn't see him hit. But then he slowly stood up, and his flak jacket fell open. I could see he was stitched right across here. And his eyes were already going out of focus. And he's looking at me, trying to say something, and I just continued to film. And within a few seconds, he did, in fact, drop dead for something. I agonised over it, but all my training and my whole life had been keep filming anyway. But he was a man I knew well. 
I like to work alone because I didn't want to be responsible for the life of any other person. I felt that I had enough to do just to stay alive myself. If you have to make a decision just for yourself, right or wrong, you stay by that decision. I was never afraid of being killed, because that's that. I mean, you're done. And I, and I, I um, didn't want to be badly wounded. I'd seen many badly wounded people. I didn't want uh, a load of shrapnel in my guts, for instance, and die a painful death on the battlefield. Uh, I just took it as it come otherwise. I was helping drag some wounded in, and they began to concentrate on the tree that I was behind, thinking that that was a command post or something. And a young lieutenant nearby, he stood up and said, they've got you targeted, get across here. I sort of was uh, in two minds, and, but I did take his word on this occasion. So, so I raced across and took the cover behind the armoured personnel carrier. But uh, within a minute, a launched grenade or a mortar, I'm not sure, landed about four feet away and killed a couple of soldiers and severely wounded a photographer friend, Cambodian, I was with, and uh, wounded me very badly in the right leg particularly, and the left leg a little, and uh, sort of in the back with shrapnel. And fortunately here I was carrying a recorder, which was a small cassette recorder, which was smashed to pieces but um, uh, saved my life. Once they got me clear of the fighting, they saw that I was losing a lot of blood, and they gave me a direct transfusion of coconut milk, straight from the tree. It gives you the volume, of course, it, it doesn't replace the blood, but it keeps you alive until you can get to a hospital and get a blood transfusion. I formed the strongest personal relationships of my life in Indochina. Unfortunately, I lost many, many, many of them, particularly in Cambodia and to a lesser extent in Vietnam. And uh, when I had to leave Indochina, a good part of me died in a sense. It's very difficult to recapture that uh, feeling of comradeship that I had with many, many people there. Many people that I will obviously never see again, mainly because they're dead. Yang Sam Rung was one of my best friends, a Cambodian photographer. dear friends from Europe to this base of a Liberation Army unit. Welcome Wilfred Burchett. Welcome your intention to get an inside story of those who have been faced with the alternative of fighting or dying. Welcome dear guests whom we are ready to tell what we have been doing to keep in check US imperialism and its Pentagon generals. Richard, you were yes. once regarded you you as public enemy number one by the Americans. Do you think this is why the Australian government has taken the action it has? Well, it could very well be. I, I really don't know. I, I know that a lot of emotions have been, uh, you know, worked up about uh, my, uh, well, uh, my activities over the past 20 years and so forth. Uh, I, I Who pays you in France? Hmm? In the past could be regarded as treasonable? No, I don't think so at all. Right, yes. Mr. Burchard, have you, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, or are you a Communist? No. Uh, well, I think that we... Yes, yes. yes. You're a complete and utter liar. That is all you are. Well, I've no doubt you've come along with the intention of saying that. Yes. Well, I see it. See? 
<laughs> Mr. Frank Galvalli at the present time is interviewing one of the pressmen. He called Mr. Birch a liar. It was rather an unpleasant sight in here for a few moments. I was treated as some great super devil. The journalists were shoving each other out of the way, uh, pushing each other's microphones. I was stumbling over cables and cameras, all in their haste to, uh, uh, to get in a question of this. Uh, uh, Antichrist who'd suddenly arrived back in the, in the country. His name is Wilfred Burchett. He's an Australian, but he lives in France. A respected international journalist with a lifetime's work behind him, covering wars mostly, 39 to 45, Korea, Vietnam. In Australia, his name is a dirty word. Many think he should stand trial for treason. Some would like to see him hanged. And why? Because for most of his working life, spanning the great post-war confrontations of capitalism versus communism, nationalism versus imperialism, Wilfred Burchett chose to report from the other side. The end of the Vietnam War was the end of the clear-cut issues for Burchett. Before long, Vietnam invaded communist Kampuchea, its former ally. China, in turn, invaded Vietnam. Forced into taking sides, Burchett chose Vietnam and alienated his old Chinese friends. He reports on the Vietnamese invasion of Kampuchea and sees at first hand the atrocities of the Pol Pot regime, a regime he once supported. The political and moral convictions which sustained Wilfred Burchett for his entire working life are thrown into disarray. The Khmer Rouge regime, in terms of the extermination of its own people, is one of the most atrocious in world history. What is still a big question mark is how a thing like that could have come about with people who called themselves revolutionaries, communists, socialists, whatever, how they could have degenerated into leading such a regime. I'd always thought that Hiroshima was the most horrific story I would ever have to report on. Later I realized, of course, that Cambodia was far worse. What happened in Hiroshima it was to one city what happened in Cambodia was to an entire nation. I'm still mystified as to how what happened could happen. That's what I'm really interested in finding out. Well, I, I thought it had somebody opened up or some uh, group opened up with a uh, light machine gun. And you could, uh, of course, the driver was hit with almost the first burst. I could feel his blood coming onto my hands. But he's a terrific chap and he kept going and that's what saved us. If he'd stopped, we'd have been finished. And I remember one great shock, and I thought we'd been hit by a heavier weapon. The blood was pouring down from the driver. I was amazed that he could keep going. Australian journalist and film crew on a major highway about 75 kilometers northwest of Phnom Penh. The journalist, 69-year-old Wilfred Burchett, and the three members of the crew escaped unhurt.
Every weekend, Nicaraguans of all ages and classes gather all around the country in paddocks and on sports fields for basic military training. In the event of a full-scale invasion, they'll be the first and the last line of defence, together with the regular army. This civilian militia is neither well-trained nor well-equipped. There are claims that the Sandinistas get their weapons from Cuba and the Soviet Union. While this may be true, they buy them wherever they can. Young and inexperienced, and often poorly armed, the civilian militia suffer high casualty rates. Many are high school students, volunteers who give up a year's schooling to fight against the Contras, invading the mountainous border areas of northern Nicaragua. No queremos definitivamente volver a él, pues. ya tenemos la experiencia, ¿no? asesinato, tortura, persecución a los jóvenes, el estudio, no se daba como ahora. Pues. Y con la revolución, 79 para acá, han habido muchos logros, pues, de los cuales el, el imperialismo dice que es comunismo. Pues. Y ellos atacan siempre con, la, con el legado del comunismo. Pues. Y no, pues aquí ustedes pueden observar el tipo de proceso que se ve en Nicaragua. Y nosotros seguimos adelante.
General Augusto Pinochet has ruled Chile since 1973, when a military coup brought him to power. Los responsables de la muerte de mi hijo y de tantos otros son los asesinos que gobiernan en este país en este momento. Tenemos que terminar con un gobierno compuesto por asesinos y el primero de todos es el asesino Augusto Pinochet. Esto lo digo, lo repito y lo repetiré hasta el último minuto de mi vida. In a continent infamous for its military dictatorships, Chile was the envy of its Latin American neighbors. It had a long and proud tradition of democracy until the coup. Many of Pinochet's supporters expected him to hand the country back to a civilian government after he seized power. But the general stayed on. In the first four years of Pinochet's dictatorship, as many as 50,000 Chileans were murdered as the military regime consolidated its rule. The army was established last century along Prussian lines, very rigid, very efficient. Under Pinochet, the military has had a free reign. All the armed services have their own network of spies and paid informers. There are as many as 20,000 secret police. And under the guise of combating communism, they have ruthlessly suppressed all opposition. El diario de cooperativa está llamando. Profunda preocupación existe en este lugar donde se encuentran los familiares de las personas secuestradas en el Colegio Latinoamericano de Integración, Manuel Guerrero, profesor, y José Manuel Parada, funcionario de esta vicaría. Esta es la noticia para el diario de Nothing could more clearly illustrate what is happening in Chile than the events we filmed on this day. Two men, one a teacher at this private school, the other a parent, have been kidnapped in broad daylight. Both are members of the Communist Party. They were taken by car from here at gunpoint. A teacher who tried to intervene was shot in the stomach. Parents, teachers and students have gathered to work out what action they can take. It is assumed that the two men, Manuel Guerrero, and Jose Manuel Parada have been kidnapped by the authorities. Manuel Guerrero's 14-year-old son. Hay dos posibilidades que son que son las dos variables la más posible. En lo mejor de los casos que lo echen del país, porque esto va ligado con la ceniza, se sabe. Y si es que no, lo van a matar simplemente. Y en este momento, si esperamos hasta el miércoles, perfectamente hoy día mismo puede amanecer igual que Ballestero puede amanecer en el río Mapocho sin cabeza mi papá. Eso no puede ser. Hay que pararlo simplemente. Eso no más. Es hora de noticias en Radio Chilena. La noticia de la aparición de tres cadáveres al poniente de Santiago está provocando escenas de profundo dramatismo ya que aún no se determina fehacientemente la identidad de las personas asesinadas. Tenemos la esperanza, manifestó el funcionario de la iglesia, que pronto se informe con certeza y con veracidad, ya que se trata de la vida de las personas y el sufrimiento lo estamos compartiendo con los familiares que buscan información. Cooperativa sabe lo que pasa. Tiempo, se ha señalado acá por una autoridad del Instituto Médico Legal que eh, se entregaría una comunicación oficial por parte de las autoridades de gobierno respecto al hallazgo de los cadáveres. Tenemos que 
señalar que afuera se encuentran familiares de las personas que han estado eh, desaparecidas y secuestradas, lo que ha provocado escenas de dramatismo a la llegada del de furgón. Es la información que tenemos en estos instantes directamente desde las afueras del Instituto Médico Legal, informó el diario de cooperativa. Claro. Mire, nosotros llamamos a la jefatura pidiendo instrucciones para darle una mayor información a ustedes. ¿eh? Así que dentro de unos 10, entre 10 y 20 minutos nosotros le vamos a dar. Vienen identificados los cadáveres, sí. No, por eso nos vamos a pedirle... No, no, pero ya, solo que nos digan, vienen identificados para esperar los 10 minutos. Se supone que sí, ¿no es cierto? Espere mejor, ¿eh? Sí, ya, ya. Por favor. 10 minutos. Espere, ¿no? 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 Esp
fantásticos. Ha formado gobiernos que son de todos. Y mi papá perseguía esto. Yo no estoy llorando y no he llorado hasta el momento. Yo seguiré el camino de él. Y en este momento no, no expreso mi pena, expreso mi indignación porque no terminamos nunca con esto. Nos tenemos que unir. Aunque sea yo un niño de 14 años que le llama la atención, que le haga, si quieren llamarlo, una clase de conciencia, un petitorio como quieran, pero debemos unirnos. Basta. Esto debe terminar. Tengo una hermana que tiene 8 años, se llama América. Ella aún no sabe la situación. Cuando sepa, seguramente parte de su mundo infantil se va a derrumbar. No va a tener lo que todos en esencia queremos, que es un padre. Como ya dije antes, mi papá murió con la hoz en la mano. Nosotros le pondremos el martillo, o la cruz, o un pan, un libro. Da lo mismo. Podemos terminar con esto. Gracias.